Hello and welcome to Skulls. Um, in this workshop, we're going to look at how we can deepen our artistic skills by extending our knowledge of skull anatomy. We're going to investigate different approaches to sketching skulls from linear bug line drawings to dynamic sketches. Um, we will be learning to measure proportions and angles, such as things like this, tackle the challenges of planar analysis, the planes that sculpt the skull. We're going to be drawing shape to shape and combining abstract shapes. We'll be learning about chiaroscuro modeling and core shadow and how uh, artists like Rembrandt, Caravaggio, and Leonardo da Vinci use these to help express the 3D sort of sculpture of, of the skull itself. And we're going to learn to read skulls, just like a CSI detective. Imagine we're picking up a skull, uh, we've been on a walk and we find something, we can bring it home and we can actually work out whether it's a predator or a prey, nocturnal animal, and things like this, just by looking at its teeth and eye sockets and things like this. So we're about to begin. Um, these exercises can be taken, you can take part in these exercises with any media. Uh, I use it a lot of the time just to... Uh, excuse me, uh, a simple colouring pencil, um, that was a cat outside, um, or whatever you feel comfortable with. You're going to need at least five pieces of paper uh, to be able to take part. So, I have behind me here on my table um, several of my skulls um, I've collected over the years. And when we look at animals um, from the outside, we can see a vast range of different visual appearances from a, a peacock's display of upper tail coverts <clears throat> that made that fantastic coloured fan at the back of the peacock, the display, to the wrinkly skin of an elephant. And when we start looking from the inside out, we start to see striking similarities in the arrangement of bones themselves. Uh, in 1849, Richard Owen wrote a book called On the Nature of Limbs, where he noticed that they were all the same bones in the same order. So if I look at my arm here, humerus radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and three little digits here, three little phalanges. And we can see this arrangement, which is called the pentadactyl limb, in all the other vertebrates on the planet. No animal has more than five fingers, and in some animals, such as birds and uh, donkeys and horses, it's reduced down to a single finger here in the middle. Yeah, on a bird, it might be those two joined together. Um, but then that's the arrangement, that's the arrangement here, okay? So that being the case, we could also say that probably is the case if we go to skulls themselves. So if we actually look at the, the, the plates in the skull, um, tetrabolts evolved around some 375 million years ago with lobe fin fishes that crawled out of the water. Um, and then from the lobe fin fishes, they became amphibians, the amphibians became reptiles, the reptiles evolved into birds and the birds. Well, yeah, from the two fire the dinosaurs, of course. Um, so we get the idea that these bone plates that we see, and here we are in a human, we've got the maxilla, which is the orange one. Purple one is called the zygomatic, that's the cheekbone one there. Love that word, zygomatic. Uh, the frontal is the green one, okay, the green bone, and the yellow is the um, parietal. Okay, so you can just get an idea of these sort of, uh, the red one is the, the, uh, the nasal bone an idea of these bone plates morphing across all these different species as they've evolved. Um, and if you look at the earliest tetrapods, you can see a very similar arrangement of these bone plates too. So I thought it'd be a good way to kind of explore the skull was thinking about the senses. It would make more sense as we go, go on through this. So skulls have evolved to be a protective cavity for the brain. The brain is sort of like the central hub of the vertebrate body, a bit like the flight deck of an aircraft. Um, it processes all the information and it's where we think and feel and have our thoughts. But it's also important that it's the place where we process the senses of the external world that we move through. Um, the smell of, place of smell goes, on, goes into the mouth. Uh, uh, smell goes into the nose. Eyesight goes into the eye sockets and touch temperature vibrations and pains go into the frame and magnum or large hole at the base of the skull. So we can see that these, these bone plates, uh, whilst they're not gonna really help you draw and sketch uh, a skull, they're, it's there out of sort of scientific interest as to what they are. But one thing you're definitely going to see are the wiggly lines between these bone plates. Now they're called the sutures. 
Um, and those are what happens is as you're being born in the womb, as you're sort of coming together and creating your own body, all these bone picks come and join together. And as you get older and mature, they fuse and become give the appearance of a single bone. Um, you can see on a human skull that's been exploded, you have the frontal, the parietal, the zygomatic, and the maxilla. Here, yeah, you can see on an exploded skull, the little bones join together to make this, this, this the cranium and the skull itself. So these wiggly little lines, let's just come back to those in a minute, they're the ones that you're going to notice. So they are, give an additional bit of elasticity to the skull. So as they bone fuses, they join together a bit like this what I'm doing with my fingers. And that additional elasticity can be important. For example, if you're a big horn sheep, um, I could show you on the sheep skull or pig skull, the sutures are very clear. Uh, big horn sheep, they bash into each other in their rocky habitats up to 20 miles an hour. The male's trying to exert dominance on the others uh, to attract the women. Um, you'll see very wide wiggly sutures in, in the bone plates. Uh, other animals, such as a Nile crocodile, that's going to take down a water buffalo in, in Africa, um, uh, it will um, take the water buffalo into a death roll. The amount of torque and tensions that go through the skull um, means that it does have very wide sutures, so that it gives a, a, additional flexibility to the nose. If you look to a gharial, um, freshwater uh, fish-eating crocodile, you'll see that the sutures are almost complete, almost impossible to see, sort of joined up. They have you know, a little bit less of a robust experience of life itself. So generally, if things have quite a boisterous lifestyle, you'll see wide sutures um, in, the, in the bone plates. Um, so, well, first of all, I thought we'd look at teeth. I'm going to pick an animal up and have a look at its teeth. Um, imagine you've been out walking in the glens of Scotland or somewhere out in the wild. And you pick up a skull like this and you start wondering, well, what animal is this? So if I look at the de dentine on this skull here, you can see they've morphed into grinding plates for grinding up the food. So sheep eat a lot of grass, as you probably know. They spend a lot of their time down like this, eating all day to get as much nutrition out of that grass as possible. And the, the job of the teeth is to prepare the food for, for digestion. Grass contains a lot of silica. So it's a very tough food to digest. So the, the initial job of the teeth is to really start grinding it um, to prepare that food. Um, so they have no food teeth for eating meat. So these are all for vegetarians, all their veg teeth. You want to just hear there's something called the interdental gap. You'll also see this interdental gap on horses. Um, but interesting on sheep, cows, llamas, and alpacas, you notice here at the front, there aren't the front teeth that, that that horses have. Instead they have a hardened gum plate called a dental pad. So they use this to pinch off um, grass blades. So from this I can tell it's, it's a herbivore. It's, it's someone that's going to spend its life eating vegetables and grass. However, if I look at a skull such as this one, I can see teeth are quite different to so the key teeth have evolved for a very different purpose. At the front here we have six little bones, little, little teeth, sorry, on the top and the bottom. These are called the incisors. So they're used for scraping meat off the bone. Uh, the second one's back of the canines, these larger ones here, they're used for impaling the prey and taking it to its death. Carnassials are for scraping off the flesh from the bone and of course you won't have those types of teeth carnassials there. At the back here we have molars again for breaking up bits of gristle and bone and um, diff more harder uh, meat to digest from the animal and other bits of body tissue. On the back there on African hunting dogs they might be called shearing molars. So those are specialized teeth for eating meat uh, compared with the other dentine which has evolved just to grind up the grass. You'll also be able to see um, carnivorous teeth on animals such as moles, subterranean carnivores, and they have a similar type of teeth arrangement for eating earthworms and insects. So, yeah. Okay, so there we have predators and prey and their teeth and how you can identify what type of animal they are when you find a skull. Just thought we'd look at some slightly different uh, teeth now. Um, now, I did have here somewhere um, some fish teeth. 
which I have instantly lost. Apologies for that. But here we go. I think this is a haddock. So I think those are haddock teeth. So fish teeth tend to be sharp and small and primarily feature on the carnivorous fish. But you also get scraping teeth um, for scraping uh, algae off the rocks um, and things like that. The earliest form of teeth, of course, is the fish's teeth. And um, we can also find these in uh, sharks. So here is a shark's skeleton, or what's left of a shark's skeleton. And you might be wondering where all the other bones are. But the rest of the other shark's skeleton is made up of cartilage. It's only the jawbone here that is made up of bone, the hard bone it needs in this part, this part to really get that bite force to work. And you'll see these teeth coming out like on a repeating conveyor belt of teeth, forever there doing their job as to killing and, and you know, a real machine there that is. So the, the body of the shark's skeleton is made up of cartilage, a bit like in our nose here, which gives that incredible fluid, flexible swimming motion that you see that sharks have. It enables that type of motion. So bone itself is a bit harder, isn't it? It's, um, it's still important to remember that it's still quite flexible. So it's made up of a combination of calcium phosphate, which is a mineral compound, with uh, collagen. Um, so the collagen, which is an orga organic kind of compound, allows that flexibility. And we can see a lot of flexibility when we think of a, a cheetah running. The bone becomes incredibly lithe and fluid and sort of supple. But we can also think of it as incredibly heavy, like in an, in a, an elephant's leg. Though I just think that's an important point to think of. You can actually take the calcium phosphate out of the bone by soaking it in vinegar for a couple of weeks and it becomes as soft as a, as a sort of rubber toy. And you can conversely bake out the collagen by putting it in an oven and then you can shatter the skull. So um, that's bone for you. Um, sharks have these repeating teeth, but also do our friend the crocodiles. So we're just have a quick look at the crocodile. They have a bud underneath the tooth. So when it loses a tooth, another one instantly grows. While we're here, I just want to just notice you two things at the top of the skull here and here. The, the two little holes either side of the, the bilateral line of symmetry, they're called temporal fenestra or uh, windows of the head, I suppose that really translates to. These are the diapsids. So this arrangement of the holes um, allows for muscle attachments to create stronger and also enables the jaws to open more widely. Think about that. It was commonly seen in the dinosaurs. Um, so it's known as the diapsids or two arches. We can also see it in other reptiles, contemporary ones, uh, such as monitor lizards. And it's evolved about 300 million years ago. Um, and that's a really cute, cool little feature to notice. It also enables the skull to be lighter. Uh, teeth have evolved for meat and for veg. But they've also evolved in other curious ways. We could look at a leopard seal here that takes in big gulp, gulps of seawater and then squashes its mouth shut and then uses the teeth to filter out the krill. An even more extreme example of this are in these sort of trident-shaped colander sieve feeding teeth of the crab eater seal, where it says crab eating, it really relies on eating um, Antarctic krill and takes in a big gulf of water, and again squeezes out that water through its teeth and retains the important nutritious Antarctic krill there. Uh, marine iguanas also have this tricuspid teeth for scraping algae off rocks. So we have an idea about what teeth are, but they can be incredibly creative um, in their, their food processing ability. <laughs> Uh, birds don't have teeth. The ancestor of birds evolved from Archaeopteryx 150 million years ago that did have teeth, that was, had a reptilian muzzle. And about 20 to 30 million years later, you start to see the beak of the bird. And we can think of Darwin's finches and how the beak is a very efficient tool at eating all these different ranges of you know, being insect foods, insectivorous, grasses. Um, it can in, in eat a whole range of different food without the need to evolve these heavy, different specialised teeth. A flamingo sort of uh, <laughs> eats upside down its head in the water like this and it gulps uh, a mouthful of water and it can shut its beak tight like a box. You'll notice that the bottom bill is thicker than the top 
sort of like a bit more of the inverse of other birds, which tend to have the bigger, the top bill beak bigger. You can then shake its head around and filter out the um, the, the, the krill, the, sorry, the, the, the shrimp-like crustaceans in its beak um, from the water. And it can also pump out the water um, using its, its tongue, which is in a groove at the bottom, and filter out the shrimp-like crustaceans, which contain the beta-carotenoids that make the flamingo really pink. Uh, birds' beaks can open on some species really like, like this, like a gate, but our jaw just goes down. Particularly on species like parrots, they can have a very wide gate for eating the, um, the peanuts and things that they feed on. Um, ducks also have a filter feeding system on the edge here of their beak called a pectin. So when they're dabbling in the water and they want to squeeze water out, they can retain valuable food sources by on, on the edge of the beak, which is called the pectin, and constrain the water, trap the food. Also useful for preening uh, their feathers. Okay, we're going to start our first drawing exercise now. Everyone's been, oh God, when are we going to get onto drawing? Well, now we're going to get onto drawing. So one of the things that we could be able to do and think about today is our, as illustrators and drawers is creating the illusion on a flat piece of paper. So flat paper is certainly flat, there's nothing behind it. But what I want us to do is imagine that there's depth inside this piece of paper. Now, the first way we can think about that depth and the visualization that we can create as an illusion of depth is to just simply do overlapping lines. So where one line is in front of another, the convention becomes sort of fairly obvious that that form that that delineation is creating is in front of that form. And that one's behind that one and so on and so forth. So I want you first of all to create an abstract doodle of a landscape going away from you. So you can start sketching now. So in the, in the distance, the, lo the lines can be lighter and closer together. In the foreground, the lines could be slightly darker. And you're going to create that illusion of depth in the illustration such as that. Okay. So we're going to take a, a line for a walk, as Paul Clay said uh, drawing was, taking a line for a dot that went a dot is a line that went for a walk. And we're gonna start with the outside edge. So we're gonna pick a point, and we're gonna sketch on a beaver skull in two minutes. And we're gonna find a starting point at the top. And we're gonna follow that line as it goes around the outside form. So the outside line is the one that cuts that form out from the background. But I want you to let that bug go for a walk and go in and out of every nook and cranny. And where the lines are hard, go straight and when they're sharp and try and capture the real character of the form of that of the object we're looking at which is going to be the beaver skull. After you've done that I want you to imagine going into the interior almost like this is a piece of landscape and imagine that the bug is going to climb around the interior forms. Now these are going to start giving it its 3D illusion of form whereas the outside line simply cuts out that form from the background. Now we're going to actually start modeling the form in its 3D. You can almost imagine the bug having a tiny little pair of skis on and skiing down the side of this mountain here and the marks that the skis make actually sculpt out the 3D form of the landscape, the undulating side of the shell. Okay, so we're going to start now. So start sketching now. So this is a beaver skull. So begin at the top and then start drawing around the form, along here, down the side, noticing the character of the form where it's, the line is hard and straight, oops, sorry, and then where it bends and curves, goes around the form. The one line is in front of the other, use that to emphasize that that form is coming in front of that form. Just so, vary the depth of your line as you're sketching. So as you come along here on the jaw, and the jaw is weighted, and the weight is being supported there on that shape, you can press down harder on your pen or pencil, and then come down here and under the jaw, you can press down harder where the weight's supported. Equally, where the form goes away from you, you can make a lighter mark. So try to look at the beaver skull more than your paper as you're doing this exercise. 
but do refer back to your drawing just to sort of make sure you're keeping your proportions accurate. So let's just carry on with this drawing. You can see the suture here, we talked about the wiggly line coming down here on the zygomatic arch. Okay, so whilst you're doing this drawing, I'll just pick up the beaver skull and tell you a few other little things about it. <clears throat> So if you look at our beaver skull here, uh, you'll notice it's got very orange teeth at the front of it. it looks like it's been smoking 20 Rothman a day. Um, but this is actually um, iron, iron in the teeth. Uh, the same reason that Mars is, 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 is called the red planet. You know, it's rusted iron that we're seeing on Mars. This iron here is um, orange and it makes the dentine on the front of the tooth much, much harder than the dentine on the back. So every time this beaver is, cutting down a tree that's going to use that tree to make a habitat or its den, um, the tooth self sharpens by the background of the dentine, back bit of dentine wearing down quicker. Uh, you also notice if we have a look at the skull, it's got these very wide flared zygomatic arches. This is to allow mus muscles to come through from the top, which join up here at the sagittal crest, to come through and join up the, on the, the jawbone there, which creates um, Obviously, industrial processing, which means that this beaver can cut down a tree with its face. Um, it has eyes really high up, and this is important on semi aquatic uh, mammals. This allows them to be able to see above the waterline. Imagine the waterline's here, like that, so it can see above the waterline. So it's a very specialized skull that enables the beaver to, to live out the lifestyle that it does. You can see that the beaver is actually um, herbivorous as well. By looking at its teeth, we can tell that it must eat plant matter. Um, it doesn't need the wood chips. Um, so we have a sort of fantastic beaver skull. I'm just gonna give you another few seconds on the sketch, 10 seconds more. So yeah, you try and Draw all the little detail of the bone and then the dentine and the shape of the teeth grinding up that veg. You can add in these little pit marks as you start to evolve your drawing and get more detail in there. And these little bits of sort of delicate bone which make these sort of delicate intricate lines here. Okay, so by all means come back to this and um, freeze frame your drawing. It's a really good idea when you are, you know, getting comfortable with drawing skills to so draw them from different angles, draw them from behind, draw them from front, draw them from difficult foreshortening views that we'll come on to in a minute um, to familiarise yourself with, with your skulls. So next of all we have the dynamic method. So this is very popular in drawing in film schools and in CGI where the artists have got to give their drawings to um, animators that are going to create that animal in the computer environment, a bit like uh, the Jungle Book, films like that, which you can see this incredible uh, lifelike ability now for people to actually make the animals look real and they even get the muscles flexing and twisting on the actual uh, animals inside the computer. So to be able to do dynamic drawing, we need to sort of understand perspective. So just to take you through, a lot of you I'm sure would already know this, but imagine yourself standing on a railway track. I really don't recommend doing this, but just imagine it all the same. And you'll notice that the two uh, parallel lines of the railway tracks converge to a single vanishing point. Okay. That is called the vanishing point. So the vanishing point can really be anywhere, dependent on the angle of the object you're looking at. You can imagine some sort of augmented lines on this glasses box and the the vanishing point sort of moving around and it's where those two lines will actually recede to of a parallel form. Anything that's parallel, the side of a book, the side of a mobile phone, any two parallel lines. So if I take the idea of that railway track and I put two railway tracks together, I could then make a short side and a long side which gives me a box in perspective. Now, what I can do, if I want to find the centre 
of a box, I can do a box and do a cross. That gives me the exact centre. If that form, that plane of the side of the box is in perspective, I can do the same again there, like that. But this time you'll notice that the area of the plane that's nearest to you is wider than the one at the back. This is very much like the effect of the railway sleepers getting smaller as they go away from you. But that's a really useful tool because most vertebrate animals are symmetrical. Um, you can think of the flat fishes, which aren't particularly symmetrical, and obviously there's some crabs which have one claw bigger than the other. But by and large, a lot of vertebrates are symmetrical, sort of lying down the middle. Um, particularly when we're drawing boxy animals, such as the sea turtle here, which is quite a boxy animal, we can use this sort of method of construction to sort of understand what's going on. And it can be very empowering, particularly if the animal's moving around and moving quite quickly. If we have a rough understanding of perspective and these frameworks of boxes that we can place our animals into, um, it's a really sort of powerful tool. Uh, boxes above the eye line here, you'll be able to see into the box underneath or onto the belly of the base of the green turtle here. You can add on similar other box-like structures for the, the paddles. And one here, like a box attached to the head. And similar, if it swims beneath the eye line, you'll be able to see on top of the, the shell. And you can add additional boxes for the flippers at the front and a framework for the box for the head here. They're just a light underlying construction marks that can help you know what's going on for visualization skills. Um, so by all means, do freeze frame this if you felt it's gone a bit too quick on this, but having some good basic level of understanding of perspective for construction drawing and what they call dynamic drawing is really important. How you begin a dynamic drawing is different depending on different people. Some people like a really organic, seeing the circles and round forms, which might be your way of going. What we're going to be doing today is seeing sort of box-like forms, almost like a, a shoebox and putting the skull in a shoebox and then using that as a method for starting or sketching. Another quite good useful method is to see a kite shape. So if I pick up uh, this form here of the of a sheep, turn it away from you. You can imagine on the skull here, a simple kite form with a tube-like shape beneath it for the eye sockets. And that's a good way to start. So a lot of people, when I'm doing drawing workshops, they always want to, bit of guidance of knowing how to start. You can also imagine it, a piece of paper, it's a square sitting beneath your skull that orientates it in space and gives it that three dimensional quality. Okay, so as we're sketching this next one, try to think you're drawing a head, not a face. So what I mean by that is that when we're kids, we draw the two eyes, the nose and the mouth, and it's a very flat form. What we're trying to do today is create 3D. So we're gonna work from the crocodile here, so what we're going to do first of all, is imagine that we're gonna gift wrap this crocodile box and we're gonna put it into a, a shoe box. So it would be a long shoe box. So before we start the sketch, what I want you to do is sketch out a frame to put the skull in here. Like that. So could you sketch out a frame like that? Then I'm gonna ask you to find the center of that frame by doing the cross to cross. That helps me find the bilateral line of symmetry. So that is your construction point, that your, your start. If the box is too small whilst you're sketching, don't cramp the crocodile's nose up, allow it to come outside the box and in front of the box. So I would start sketching now. So start up here at the top, which is where they call the parietal bone is. That shape there with one of those holes in, which we talked about earlier from the, the temporal fenestrae there. I'll sketch that in here at the top. And do a, a circle either side of the line of symmetry. Okay, so you'll end up with starting out right at the top up here. And then allow your drawing to come and further down. So I place in the bilateral line of symmetry that runs through the crocodile. So I'd sketch that line there, which is what I'm talking about, this line here. 
coming down through the nasal bone here, which we looked at earlier. These are the maxillas here by the side. Sketching the eye sockets. Around here, you have this sort of arch here. And then we have come up here, which is called, this is the zygomatic bone, often called a ugal bone on reptiles, but it's the same sort of thing. Um, come down here, we've got what's called the frontal and the prefrontal bones here. The teeth are incredibly sharp. So sketch out the form and then start these interlinking teeth, the one teeth perfectly interlinks with the one coming down from the top. And they're incredibly sharp. So I would be doing really sharp flip marks with my pencil to get the sharpness of the tooth. So whilst you're doing that drawing, I'm just gonna hold the skull up to the camera. I don't know whether you'll be able to see this. But what you'll notice when you look at crocodile skulls on the aquatic ones, you'll notice this really rough texture on their snout. And for ages, I really wondered what it was. They're tiny little dots that look like they have blackheads on them on a raised dimple. Now, through these tiny little holes, which are called foramina, there are nerves that go through the skull. Because it spends much of its life lying quietly in the shallows, waiting for its prey to swim by or come to the water's edge for a drink, these little bumps are pressure receptors that evolved million years of years ago and solved the problem of how a creature with armor-like skin can tackle uh, the feeling of the ripples in the water. Um, so it actually means that the snout is sensitive to water ripples and things like that and it can sense it through the skin. Interestingly, um, crocodiles that live on dry land don't have this feature. So that's something really interesting, isn't it? Um, they can feel through their skull. Okay, so we're gonna carry on with this drawing, coming down here, sketching out here, allowing coming into where the nostrils are, down along here, sketching all those shapes here. So by all means, break the shape of the box, draw beyond it. So if I'm just gonna sketch in quickly here, Yeah, my box is slightly too short, so what I need to do is come in beyond the box to put the edge of the nose in here. Yeah, so I've broken the framework because the box is too short, so don't stick to the framework. You can go beyond it if you need to. Okay, so that is a constructed drawing of a crocodile. Um, and you can see the bone plates that are listed there. Next of all, we're going to look at the eye sockets. So I'm going to take my sheep and have a look at my sheep. So if we pick this skull up, we learned it was, this was a, um, a prey animal earlier by looking at the fact that it's a, a herbivore eating grass. But now we're going to look at where the eye, eye sockets are. So on this animal, you can see when we're looking at the orbits, they're on the side of the head. So this animal spends all its day down in the grass and it wants to get as much peripheral vision to be aware that while it's eating its dinner, there might be something else out there looking for their dinner. So here we have the prey animal and here we have the predator. So this is actually a, uh, a sheep and a Scottish red fox. It was a skull found by someone who went out walking and I bought it on eBay. And it always makes me laugh when I buy them off eBay, if I buy from an ethical source, of course. And it says that the condition is used, used by a previous owner, of course, which was a fox. Um, now this animal here at the back needs to be able to judge the distance of how far away the prey animal is in front of it. So we can test this idea out on ourselves. So eyes on the front, which we have eyes on our front as well as, as predator animals. If we shut an eye, take one finger, and then try and join those two fingers up and see if they can meet up. You should notice it's much easier to do with both eyes open. Because when both eyes are open, the overlap of the eyes allows 3D vision and depth of vision. And that's what this animal needs to judge the distance as it's sneaking up on the prey. It wants to judge the distance of the animal in front of it. So when it goes to the kill, it knows exactly how far it's going to need to leap away. And this one, on the other hand, 
use as much peripheral vision around it so it can see the predator sneaking up from any angle on it. So I made a joke here, why wouldn't you take a horse to the movie? <laughs> uh, because it seems a little bit flat to me. Yeah, you're better off taking a tiger or something with a great deal of 3D vision. Horses do have some depth of vision uh, at the front here, just sort of banging their nose on the grass when they're going down to eat. Of course, we have 3D vision as well. So we've evolved from monkeys and apes um, that swing through the trees and need a lot of depth of vision to sort of manage their environment. Uh, also, we've eaten, uh, been eating <laughs> historically um, ants and insects and things off twigs that we put into little burrows and holes and nooks and crannies in, in bits of wood. And we need the 3D depth of vision to judge that. Um, lemurs and lorises are very much the same type of thing with their eyes on the front with their heads as well. Um, so eyes on the front suggests a predator, eyes on the side, um, a, a, a herbivore. It doesn't work particularly in the, in the ocean when you look at things like orcas and killer whales and things which obviously have the eyes on the side. On the land you can see that this general rule um, working. Um, so now we're going to look at big eyes. Why do animals, some animals have big eyes? Um, let's pick up a... What can that tell us about the skull we're looking at? So this is an ostrich skull. And it has amazingly big eyes. But when we think about eyes being big, we probably would think, hmm, maybe eyes that live out at night, nocturnal animals, or owls that hunt primarily at night, but there are species that hunt during the day, in the early evening and things like that. And they have very big eyes. Uh, for being able to see their prey. Um, very much the case here of this Tarsia. This Tarsia's ancestors um, would have had smaller eyes, I would imagine, and the Tarsias that had the bigger eyes were more able to see their prey, and they were more able to see predators coming towards them. So those are the ones that survived. And they were able to survive by having that adaptation. They get bred, and very much like when you breed dogs, if you combine animals with similar characteristics, you can actually exaggerate that characteristic in the offspring. Which you can see, we have tiny, tiny dogs, and really, really, really big, big dogs. Um, in the 1950s, there was a man who drove around America buying up all the chickens, the baby chickens with the smallest wings, and then he bred them together and managed to, um, by artificial selection, evolve a chicken without any wings at all, a bit like the Maori bird. And he thought he'd sell it to big production and farmers so they wouldn't need a fence to fence the chicken in. But I think, you know, he went to manufacturers and people who are selling these chickens and said, well, people like chicken wings. So he didn't make the money he thought he was going to. So animals with the bigger eyes in that uh, specialist habitat of being nocturnal, um, eating insects at night, they're um, carnivorous, uh, tarsius are, and um, the bigger eyes enable them to be able to see their predators coming to get them and also enable them be able to see the little insects at night and get their food. So you can see how that kind of characteristic evolves and, and gets passed on. Same is true of tigers. Um, they, uh, wild cats are predominantly uh, nocturnal and um, ti Bengal tiger skulls hunt on the jungle floor, which is really, really dark anyway. So they, they have then evolved to have big eyes to be able to see their prey. And that comes back to the ostrich. This is a bit of a mystery, isn't it? Why has the ostrich got such big orbits? Well, very much the same way that the ones that would have been predated on have the smaller orbits, and you end up with the ones with the bigger ones. The ostrich can't fly. It lives on the savannah of Africa, where it's actually very bright, but it needs to be able to see the predators from a long way off, so it can then run away um, and get the hell out of there. Um, so the ostrich have very big eyes to be able to spot um, predators from a long way off. So that's of interest. I think now, oh yes, eyes high up on the head. We just talked about these hippos, semi-aquatics, and also very large eye sockets we see here on the common seal. Now we're going to do measuring angles and proportions. We're going to do a measured drawing of the ostrich skull, and we're going to learn to measure. Okay, so measuring is something I can do with the thumb and pencil method. I can find the width of my head and compare it with the height of my head. Or I can compare the width of my head with the distance between my central bilateral line of symmetry, my sternum and the outside edge of my arm. I can compare 
and make comparative measurements. So I can do that by just holding it straight and drawing my thumb up to make a marker and then comparing and contrasting different relationships. And then I can compare and contrast the relationship on my paper, which might be a different length. It doesn't need to be what they call site size, which I find absolutely painstaking and I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it at all. <coughs> where you copy the exact same proportions from what you're seeing onto the paper, which tends to leave really little drawings. Um, tend to be a bit more freer than that. Um, so that's one method of measurement. Another method of measurement is to be able to measure the angle. Where you almost imagine a protractor sitting on top of your pencil. You can hold it out horizontal and imagine a protractor that way, or hold it out a vertical and imagine a protractor holding that way, and the angle that you're seeing things at that lie through it. Okay, so we're going to combine those two methods and we're going to be drawing off a computer screen again and we're going to start here looking at the ostrich. So what I'm going to do first of all is find a, a comparative measurement. So perhaps it's here between you know, that lacrimal bone is and the tip of the nail of the bird, so that the beak section. So that's pretty much halfway compared with that part to the end of the bird skull there. So I can make a measurement there and there, and I can make just marks on the paper as to where these proportions are. Uh, just some simple divisions on your drawing to make those. Then I can add in the angle of, we were looking at before, by measuring the angle. So I can hold up a horizontal against that line and see that's about 30 degrees-ish, the angle that goes down there. And I can make a line on my paper like this. So then what we're going to be doing is looking at these sea of subtle different angles. The human mind likes things to be simple, it likes um, horizontal and verticals, but what we're looking at here is a whole range of very subtle different angles that we can measure and have a guess at. Now whilst a lot of drawing tutorials always recommend working the whole of the drawing up in one go, I often or not start with certain area and establish the relationships of the proportions and the shapes until I feel comfortable that I've worked that area out. So something like here. And then from there I can go shape to shape and start navigating my way across the different shapes, making looking at negative shapes such as this one here or this one here, as well as the positive shapes, which might be this shape here. Like this. And then I'm going to sketch and draw along and create these sort of gracile lines, this very elegant skull here. Okay. So try sketching that through. You'll notice that the dark notes tend to recede and push back, whereas lighter shading enables the bone to project forward. Contrasting the dark with the light will create an area of visual interest maybe a focal point and also really help that the background go back and the foreground to come forward, foreground. And as I'm sketching, I'm drawing along the form, trying to make suitable marks, for the shading and drawing in little lines of the sutures here. Okay, and then trying to sculpt the orbit, the round shapes by drawing around the form there even adding a bit of texture onto this lip of light. You're getting this sort of granulated bone texture here. Okay, so just, just a minute more on this one. Okay, and we'll just you can be able to freeze this if you need longer. Next up, we're going to look down the nose of our animal. Let's look down the nose of our red fox here. So if we look down the nose cavity of our fox, we should be able to see lots of tiny little bones uh, inside that um, increase the surface area of the skin. And in doing so, they can increase the number of smell receptors that you have um, up your nose. Um, this can in be really good at improving your sense of smell. So the vertebrate with uh, one of the best sense of smell of any vertebrate is the bears. And uh, a polar bear can smell its prey up from up to nine miles away 
out on a, um, a field of ice and can even smell prey through up about up to three feet of solid ice, which is an incredible ability. So in increasing the surface area, the turbinates also um, enable blood vessels to be in there, which if you think about something like a leopard seal in the Antarctic, it's breathing in freezing air, it can then warm that air up in the nasal compartment of the skull before it goes into the, the lungs of the animal. So that's something we can see. Also here, this skull has been drawn at a foreshortened angle. So it's a very challenging angle. So when we are drawing things here, if I think about my arm straight, which is the fox comes around and compare with my arm, we go into a foreshortened position, which is really challenging here. My arm disappears and the skull sort of disappears. And we come out to the side and a side view. So it's this compression that you get in foreshortened positions, which is a really challenging one. I'm going to lead to an additional workshop. There's so much to cover on that. Um, Okay, so while we're here, we just kind of like get through antlers, horns and tusks. Um, I live on Richmond Park out there at the moment. The um, deer are having antlers uh, growing um, on top of their heads here from the, the frontal bone that we look at where they attach here. And the antlers grow out there. It's the fastest growing um, uh, tissue, bone tissue of any um, part of any animal. It can grow in, up to an inch a day. So they have different shapes. The fallow deers have these kind of elaborate uh, shapes like this and the red deer have these longer um, more kind of gracile uh, horns they lock into each other during rutting season in October um, and they're also used for display so the women know that they're um, you know, mating with a, with, a, with a successful male um, so those are antlers uh, next up we have horns these are only all only, it's only males that have the horns on the deer except for reindeer and caribou uh, next up we have horns, so we see horns here on sheep and on cows. They're also present in females, uh, it's a good weapon if you've got uh, some offspring and you're a female cow, you want to keep the wolves at bay, you've got horns. So horns have bone growing inside them and they have a keratin coating on top. So this actually is a proper bone, actually that, that spiral shape here and here. Yeah? So um, those are horns. Curiously, the shape of the horn and the way it grows and the proportions of it are the same on the ram there. Um, and it's the same also that's in the nautilus shell. So it's actually the same spiral um, of, of proportionalities, which I always find fascinating. Um, we can also see tusks. So tusks are an adaptation of the uh, front teeth here. You can see here these kind of canines. So on a walrus, they're really, really long. They're called ice walkers, and they use the tusks to pull themselves up onto ice floes, dig into the ice so they don't fall off, and they can also use them to fight with, with other females for dominance. And uh, you can also see tusk-like adaptations on the big skull for rooting around in, in, the, in the mud. So now we're gonna try a planar analysis drawing. So sometimes a little bit confused what this means. So, when I'm sketching a shark and I look closely at the shark, I'll see that its body is not just a round tube, a bit like a toilet tube. And if I drew it as such, it might appear a bit fat and flabby, but by capturing the planes, you can capture the muscularity of the animal itself. So we're gonna look at this pig skull. This is only a quick sketch. to sketch around the form and capture the planes of the, the subject. So here on the skull, I would go in, to this shape here with arcs, and then scribble along here for the flat plane of the forehead, this area here, and then along here. So start sketching now, and start sketching the planes. I always think it's interesting when you are sketching an animal, that the forehead is, is often the hardest part, this part here, and under the chin here, it's often the soft, soft, softer mark on the, under the underneath the jaw, and that seems to be pretty universal. Um, so try and make a planar sketch, drawing along the planes. You can also sketch in the bilateral line of symmetry. Yeah. Drawing around the form. And equating it, even if it's quite just a simple, that along the jawbone, well that's going to be a 
the vertical mark because that's a plane that's vertical here. And that's what I meant about those tusk like teeth for rooting in the edge. These holes in the skull are where nerve endings come out so that you can give sense to the, uh, the nose and all the other feeling things that it's got on there. Okay, so that's a planar analysis sketch. So we'll just move on now to the next stage. Um, next up, we're going to look at the cranium, this part of the animal. So we've looked down the nose, we've looked at the teeth, we've looked at the eye sockets. Um, now we're going to look at this part of the animal here. This is an interesting skull I've, I've managed to gather. This one, interestingly, the jaw doesn't actually come off. Uh, this one, it actually remains attached, partly because it's glued, <laughs> um, but it would normally be able to open up and down um, a little bit wider than that. And it's the same is true on some sea otters, so that would help us identify the species. Um, it has up here, in the cranium area, this very large piece of bone here, that's called the sagittal crest. So that implies that the masseter muscles that join up here and go to the jawline means it's got quite powerful bite forces. So this animal here is an omnivore, so it's got both teeth for eating meat and that can also uh, grind up and eat veg and grain and grasses and uh, seeds and things like that. It's a, it's a very, it's an animal that can eat a whole range of different things. And this one is a badger, so this is a badger skull. Um, and uh, so we notice this large part up here, which is the sagittal crest. We can also notice something like this on a gorilla. So that the male gorilla has a particularly large sexual crest and a fatty pad that sits on top of it, where the female, if you look at the sketch here, doesn't. The dome of her head is much smaller. So on a skull level, we can actually start seeing the difference in the sexes between the male and the female. Um, and it is used on the gorilla as display, whilst at first it might have been thought that they need the sagittal crest because they spend all day eating nettles and veg that doesn't have a great deal of nutritional value. They need to keep eating all day long. But you need powerful um, muscles for industrial processing to, to take as much nutrition out of that veg. That the female, by not having the same characteristic whilst eating the same food, uh, you can start to assume that the dome and the large sag crest on the male is pretty much like the um, antlers on a deer. They're used to attract the female and show a healthy male. So when you start out sketching gorillas, I have these little widget things in my head that are really kind of organic, the ridge brow there, and you can just make a little thing up in your mind. And when you're out with gorillas in a zoo, it can really help get your head around what you're, what you're trying to sketch when the animal's always moving. So we can come back to the cranium here. And now look at it in, in um, we're looking at it on the badger here, the cranium part, which is the real cavity for the brain. Um, this is where the cerebral cortex is, um, the part of the brain that is um, where intelligence is ascribed. Uh, this human skull, does my brain look big in this, uh, compared with a chimp skull, for example. Uh, we can also see large craniums in the corvid family. The corvids are uh, crows, rooks, magpies, um, and they have complex social lives, a bit like an episode of EastEnders, where you'll see them out squabbling and squawking. Um, and this is often ascribed to kind of so a high level of social um, interaction in groups as to the evolution of intelligence. Not always the case, come on to that in a minute. Um, but you'll see in the ravens, and magpies have even been tested to see that they can identify themselves in mirrors. Of course, we also see in nature, brilliantly solitary evolution of intelligence in the mischievous creature, which is the octopus, um, which actually has neurons in their legs and a central coordinating brain, and of course, no skull at all. Um, so we can see conversion evolution of intelligence in mollusks there, where we have that. Um, now we're gonna work on a caroscuro drawing. So what I've got here is my red fox skull, the red fox skull has been placed under the window and I put a, a strong light, light source on it. Often when I do chiaroscuro drawings or drawings with a lot of shading, I actually draw and put a little arrow on where the light source is so I can see where the light is shining on the form. One thing I really want you to notice before we start doing this drawing 
is the darkest edge is not on the leading edge. So if we looked at the moon at night, and have the, the light of the sun on one side of the moon, the leading edge would be the darkest because there's no reflective light in space. It would just be like that. But in nature, or in our world, or on our Earth, you tend to get a lot of reflective light. So you can see on here on the skull, there's reflective light off the paper, meaning the darkest edge is along this part, or the darkest edge is here, and there's reflective light on the, what I would call the leading edge. So there are two types of shadow. So there's shadow of form, which is this shadow here, which we're going to be modelling and pulling the form out of the page. Then there's cast shadow. So this is the shadow you see of your body on the grass on a hot summer's day. So that's the cast shadow, which creates the drama. So then here we can see core shadow, or core shadow here, and core shadow on the hippopotamus's bottom here and here. Yeah, and it really can be a game changer in improving the sophistication of the look of your sketches. So begin sketching now, and I would start out with light construction lines, going down the line of symmetry here. This is called the nasal bone here. Sketch that out. This one here at the front is called the incisor bone. Okay, it's not necessary to know these things really. Come around this suture shape here, the maxilla, and sketch in here. Here we've got the incisor bones, the six little teeth on the top and the bottom. And then the canines, which interlock, one, two. Sketch those in. Here, remember, we've got these are called the carnassials, the teeth. So we're scraping the meat off the bone. Sketch those in along the top and the bottom. Add in the little dense holes, which allow nerve endings to come out. Sketch along here, the zygomatic arch. And then start putting the shading in. Now I tend to identify an area and sort of start sketching up an area. Now a lot of people try to draw up a whole drawing at the same time. But I have looked at Rembrandt sketches, the unfinished ones, on etches, and they, he often really completes an area and then lets it grow out to the next part of the drawing. Uh, so the drawing sort of evolves shape to shape or this area of a dark shape that I can then compare that area of a dark shape against and then gradually traverse my way a bit like a sort of climber around this landscape. Okay, really dark shading in, in between the nose where the real dark values are and little pitted marks that you see on the bone surface there. Okay, a little wiggly lines here. So keep shading and building up that drawing and on this arch here above the orbit. Really nice bit of dark shading there. Really get that character of that arch shape coming out here. And volumizing the form here around the cranium. A bit of a sagittal crest there at the back. Just sketch that like that. Okay. So push the range of your values, push the range of your darks in relation to your lights. And then we can also look at other artists such as Da Vinci, Caravaggio and Rembrandt. And it's always a good idea when you are creating a, a study in this style to go back and have a look at some real inspiration work that was created in the past and get an idea of the type of thing that you can do and give you an idea or some ambition in your mind as what you can do. I often look at artists throughout history when I'm doing a study of something, I think, well, what's the best version of this I can do to make it as exciting as possible? And look for inspiration from other artists. Okay, well, I hope you've enjoyed today's session. Um, if you have, by all means, please have a look at my last book, uh, The Field Guide to Drawing and Sketching Animals. Uh, there's English version, there's also a Japanese version now, and there's Russian and Chinese and a Taiwanese version coming out, which is good. Um, do you hashtag your drawings, uh, at Nature Journey Week, so I can have a look at those on Twitter. Anyone who wants to jo join a mailing list, just email me at timpond at gmail.com, timpondart at gmail.com, uh, please. And I, we will have a mailing list of different events coming up. Um, you can join Sketching Wild if you're in the UK, where we do events in and around uh, London, Richmond, Barnes Wetlands, uh, nature walks in parks, and just going out on the sketchbook. Um, if you are between 7 and 18, do have a look at the Nancy Rothwell Award under Google, uh, the Royal Society of Biology. There's a competition for 
uh, drawings such as this that help explain a little bit about the animal and art artistic too and finding things out about nature through drawing to explore nature. Um, please have a look at that as well. So until next time, bye-bye. Hope you enjoyed. <laughs>